like your magnesium is needed on a daily basis it can't be stored iodine as well is similar it can't be stored in the body so a consistent supply of minerals for that last six to eight weeks is really important so in terms of like your 25 kilo bag work out how many cows that's going to do you and over how many days and kind of keep track on that are you using enough and doing it every day and every animal has an access so feed space is important in that regard as well Hello and welcome to the Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast, for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and this is a three-part podcast in advance of the spring calving season, focusing on nutrition pre and post calving, calving the cow and caring for the newborn calf. This week I'm joined by Chagas nutritionist Ashley Claffey to find out how to manage cow nutrition in the crucial weeks pre and post calving. Ashling, you're very welcome. What kind of problems arise every spring when it comes to nutrition? Yeah, so I suppose silage quality is a big factor on farms and having silage availability, um, monitoring body condition score. Uh, so cows are housed generally for three or four months before they come into that um, rapid fetal growth period where the energy demand increases. So it's trying to maintain condition score during that period. And then I suppose there's a huge amount of clinical disorders that are linked typically during that transition period. So those last couple of weeks before the cow calves and first couple of weeks after calving is when a lot of those problems arise. Generally, two thirds of them occur in, in those couple of weeks. Um, so they can be our metabolic issues like ketosis and fatty liver, or they can be issues like subclinical milk fever. Um, so where muscle function is impaired, so that could be slow, lazy calvings, uh, cows not cleaning, suppressed immune system, so a higher risk of mastitis and metritis as well. And obviously, you mentioned there, Ashley, cow condition particularly, that's really important and I relate to a lot of the issues that you mentioned there. What are kind of the key targets that farmers need to be hitting now in the coming weeks? Yeah, so ideally we want a cow that's in optimal condition for calving, so really between 2.5 and 3 is the ideal um, condition score um, for the suckler cow. Um and that's a key pillar of getting that transition period right. We don't want a cow that's gone too thin or mobilising uh, too much condition score in the last few weeks before calving because that can increase those metabolic issues after calving when she's under more pressure in terms of needing more energy to support milk production and feed that calf. Um, but like also we don't want a cow to be too fat. That's going to increase her risk of uh, milk fever, hard calvings as well. Um, so we don't want a huge amount of fat deposited in and around um the uterus as well. And overall, cows were in good condition at housing this winter, Ashling. Can you comment on the management of those cows now at this stage that maybe some cows are too fat or might need to lose some condition now prior to Kevin? Yeah, so look, ideally these are all things we'll have done since we housed cows in terms of grouping our cows uh, depending on condition score, so trying to monitor our heavy cows from the time they've went in. Ideally, we've kind of have kept control of that in so much as possible. But look, um, it's busy on farms. It can be hard to keep your eye on everything. Um, I suppose for those last four to eight weeks, there's rapid fetal growth. So if you take a cow calf, maybe from mid-February into early April, that rapid fetal growth is already occurring for those earlier calving cows or it's just starting to occur for those later calving animals. So um, energy demand is going to increase uh, steadily over the next few weeks and her intake is going to fall off as that cow grow, or as that calf grows. Um, but for those over fat cows, um, look, if she's on 65 to 68 DMB silage, um, that's going to be probably mon- or managed a little bit in terms of she's going to be uh, restricting her energy intake on that sort of silage over the next few weeks, which will help her mobilise some of that condition if she's too fat. Um, but also we want to monitor tin cows as well in terms of um, avoiding those getting too thin. So, um. I suppose that's where knowing our silage quality comes into it too. We can make a lot better decisions if we know what silage quality we're working with for those cows on farm. And advisors often get a lot of queries, asking with regard to restricting feeding now pre heaven What impact can that actually have? Look, it's really only warranted where silage quality is very good because as the intake capacity reduces over them final six weeks before the cow or calves, that's going to naturally restrict energy intake because she's not physically able to eat as much. Um, the uterus and calf has taken up a lot more room, so the rumen uh, intake is limited. So where cows are on that 65 to 68 DMD, that natural reduction in intake capacity is going to is naturally going to restrict energy intake. Um, so I suppose it's really where silage quality is good on farm. I suppose the big limitations really are feed space then as well, Catherine. Like if we haven't got 
optimal feed space and I suppose plenty of it um, restricting high quality silage is not an option to minimise cows getting too fat because you're going to increase the risk of bullying and injury um, when you reintroduce feed. So other alternatives then are the likes of maybe feeding a bit of hay or straw to reduce overall energy intake without leaving the cow without feed. And in relation to the minerals that you mentioned earlier, Ashling, you know, a lot of farmers have commented in the past, you know, where they had an issue and then they started feeding pre-calf minerals and that seemed to have solved the problem. What yeah. pre-calf minerals are essential now for cows prior to calving? Yeah, so I suppose, Catherine, if we look at a typical uh, bagged pre-calf or mineral and we look at the label of that, like the biggest component of that mineral is magnesium and it's typically maybe 20 to 25 percent of the mineral is a, a source of magnesium and the reason for that is um, magnesium has a critical role to play in mobilizing calcium and minimizing the risk of subclinical milk fever so that's why where we introduce pre calver mineral we can help reduce a lot of these issues so like we mentioned um that cow that's slow to calve if she's sub, has subclinical milk fever, calcium is really important for muscle function. So if we're not including uh, magnesium on a daily basis and allowing that, um, it plays a critical role in the pathways that allow calcium to be mobilised from the reserves in the bones. Um, so if her calcium is suppressed when she starts bagging up and producing milk, it's going to affect muscle function. So if we take that, that's her uterine contraction, so she could be slow to calve, she might retain her cleanings. Um, it's her rumen function as well, so she could be off her feed because her rumen's not um, contracting as well as normal. And it can also increase the risk of mastitis as well and increase the risk of uh, uterine infection after calving. Um, so that's a really important element. I suppose some of the other things we look at then um, in terms of the requirements are phosphorus is very important. So we're ideally looking at 3 to 4% phosphorus. A lot of our silages tend to be low in P, and I suppose that's typically reflecting of the sort of indexes of where our silage is coming off as well. And then it's also carrying our trace elements, which are really important, and our vitamins. Um, so if we look at maybe alternative um, mineral sources like our, our buckets or our boluses, our boluses tend to predominantly have our trace elements in them, um, but it can be hard to get enough in there on a daily basis. So if we look at our actual requirements versus what the bolus is supplying, they tend to not always meet the full requirements. They're, they're a better option where maybe we're trying to top up where something is a little bit low. Um, our buckets then, um, in terms of getting sufficient amounts in um, on a daily basis is a big challenge. We can have some cows maybe over... Um, eat at the buckets because of the molasses are very palatable and maybe keep other cows away in terms of bullying um, weaker animals or younger animals away from those buckets. So the likes of our, um, our dust in, of a mineral is probably the most consistent way of giving every animal access to it and ensuring that we're getting both our macro elements with so the likes of our magnesium, sodium, phosphorus in and also our trace elements in in sufficient amounts and our vitamins as well because they're all needed our vitamins are lost during that silage preservation and um, so unless we're out at grazed grass we really need to be getting those in as well um, so in terms of what we need in terms of trace elements um, iodine is very important and is needed on a daily basis it plays a key role in fetal development and the immune system copper is linked with small or weak calves as well so really important um, selenium and vitamin E are important for the immune function of the cow um, and selenium is very important for reproduction and um, then vitamin D is linked with that calcium metabolism as well and mobilisation so that's very important and vitamin A is important for organ development in the fetus so like we've rapid fetal growth there in the last two months so there's huge demands for all of those so it's really important that we're getting them in in that final period consistently on a daily basis. And you mentioned there that's really a general speck of minerals for farmers that felt there was an issue last year what are kind of the questions they should be asking their feed merchants maybe to tailor the mineral to the requirements for their herd? Yeah, so I suppose um, we have to consider where the challenges were coming from. So sometimes we could have maybe very high levels of K in the silage and um, that mightn't be as big an issue this year. Maybe we were first cut silage didn't get as much slurry. Um, so some of those things will feed into it because potassium will uh, interfere with magnesium absorption. So some of the challenges we, we see um, mightn't necessarily reflect what's going to happen the following year because uh, 
there can be other factors feeding into it. Um, but I suppose it depends on where the challenge came from, maybe, and, and discussing it with their vet as well. Did they identify a particular element that was lacking? So, um, you know, like if iodine was an issue, like most manufacturers are limited in the amount they can put into a bag mineral. So they might have to consider maybe topping iodine up on the back of the animal for the last few days uh, or for the last few weeks before calving. Um, or if copper is an issue in a particular area and they're not getting enough from their pre calver mineral, they may have to consider a copper bolus or copper injection in the likes of those scenarios. Um, but I suppose most of the pre calver minerals are, are designed um, to cover all bases really well. Um, so I suppose consistency is the big thing and feeding it for long enough, so ideally at least the last six weeks before cows calve, that they're getting sufficient supply of it. And I know you touched on silage quality there earlier, but in relation to after the cow calves, what are kind of the key things to keep in mind with regards to nutrition post calving, considering last spring was such a extended housing period? So look, ideally, um, like for that cow prior to calving, we're talking 65, 68 DMD silage is sufficient in most cases once they're in good condition. Maybe a little bit higher quality if we have tin cows or likes for our first calvers coming in as well, where intake is a, a bigger challenge for those animals. Um, but after calving, then ideally we want to be on 70 to 72 DMD silage at least. So we need a higher quality feed in the yard for that period. I suppose if we don't have that, um. I suppose it depends on how long we're going to be housed. If access to grass um, is an option on your farm, that's great. And we try to maximise those opportunities. Um, if you're looking at cows being in for a prolonged period of time, first calvers and tin cows need to be supplemented immediately after calving um, if they're on poor quality silage. And I suppose then after two to three weeks, uh, stronger cows, they probably need to be supplemented at that stage as well, where a calf is uh, better able to, I suppose, handle a better milk supply. We need to support milk supply and minimise condition score loss if they're going to be housed for a prolonged um, period of time due to poor weather or poor soil conditions on the farm. That's great, Ashling. And finally, what are the kind of top three recommendations you have for farmers? Yeah, so I suppose, look, if they have been silage tested, it's no harm to still do that. Uh, we're still probably a month out from calving in a lot of farms, um, so it'll give you information to work with. Monitor condition score, maybe um, try group cows a little bit better or pull off a, a handful of tin cows if you have them on farm. I suppose if there's tin cows there and silage quality overall is fairly good, is there something else at play in terms of maybe a twin pregnancy that you haven't identified by scanning, if you haven't scanned cows? Um, or other health challenges, maybe consider that as well. And look, John might touch on that a bit more next week and most people will have implemented a, a herd health plan since they've housed cows as well, but that's something to maybe consider too. Um, and then getting your pre-calf or mineral right and consistent supply. So I mentioned there, the likes your magnesium is needed on a daily basis. It can't be stored. Iodine as well is similar, can't be stored in the body. So a consistent supply of minerals for that last six to eight weeks is really important. So in terms of like your 25 kilo bag, work out how many cows that's going to do you and over how many days and kind of keep track on that. Are you using enough and doing it every day and every animal has an access? So feed space is important in that regard as well. That's great, Ashling. Thanks very much. No problem. That's all for this week's episode. And my thanks to Ashling for joining me on the show. Join me next week for the second part of this podcast series focusing on calving the cow with Chagas vet John Donnan. You can catch up on all other shows and interviews from the Beef Edge podcast on the Chagas website at chagas.ie or you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our Beef programme, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.